so Jerry was inspired by and followed the example of a lot of these earlier tattooers. And the main person that kind of codified American tattooing into this really bold look was uh, Cap Coleman, who tattooed in Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> Was an interesting guy. At night, sailors would be out of town, be not in the town. They'd go in there and they'd pee all, you know, all over his front door all the time. So he fixed up a metal strip in there with a Model T coil and a and a battery. So if you pissed on that metal strip, you got a big shock, you know, in your Johnson. Coleman developed a really, really strong style. It became known as the American style. It was hallmarked by really heavy beautiful shading to distinguish the designs because the black is the, the pigment that lasts the longest in the skin. So Jerry took that as far as it could go in a really, really beautiful, well-composed, balanced style, copying a lot of designs as everybody did of existing designs and then mixing a lot of his own original stuff into the mix. There were no tattoo magazines, you know. I mean, nowadays you can go to the newsstand and get five magazines and and get a very good overall look at state-of-the-art tattoo that's going on all over the world, you know? You've got 500 designs to copy in every book you pick up. You, know, you couldn't do that back then. Every major city had a, a major tattoo artist in it. A lot of cities, that major tattoo artist happened to be the only one in the town. How many shops were there? Well, we used to, we used to say there's a hundred miles between a tattoo shop. It was a secret world. It was a really, really subterranean, outsider kind of an art. You know, you didn't just give stuff away, you know. And tattooers had closely guarded secrets. Jerry was as strong as any of them for trying to keep his stuff close to his chest. You only passed on certain information. He would send a rub off of the design to somebody. This was like a frottage. It's how we traded designs in the old days. We had these acetate stencils with, with basically a dry point line that you, you cut into that with a usually a, a 78 RPM phonograph needle and a pin vise. So we do rub offs of that and you'd get a line image of the thing and you'd trade that to other tattooers. Well he'd send off these rub offs with something wrong in it and he figured if the guy was fool enough to not correct it then the guy wasn't worth sending designs to you know or he just would laugh about it and keep sending him wrong stuff. In those days you'd hit a brick wall when you wanted to talk to somebody you wanted to be a tattoo artist. How could I learn this? Is you want to learn this? Is this, do you have a license? Is you all get me two hundred and fifty dollars? So I went and I robbed the grocery store instead, and I gave the man the two hundred and fifty dollars, and I became a tattoo artist. I never looked back. But tattooing wasn't that prevalent in those days. Um, they all had sidelines. They'd either be a boot, bootlegger or I know one that was an abortionist. But. Uh, now they have Planned Parenthood. <laughs> Problem with these guys today, they never had a real Liberty Port. I'm glad I was able to see Asia when it was the old way. Trouble with China is, when you had to clap over there, you really had to clap. Nothing we know would cure it. He itchy, he scratchy, cause he eats snatchy. Chinaman no likey. Hell of a world. An insatiable curiosity, what Buddhists call the monkey mind, led Jerry from the tattoo shops of State Street, Chicago, to the call of the open seas via the U.S. Navy outpost at Great Lakes. The sea, I think, was the overriding thing with Jerry, and he relished the sort of, of course, macho environment of it. He'd sailed on some sort of, uh, you know, canvas ships in some regard navigate one of the schooner ships that didn't have a motor or one of the big sailing ships. And the whole freedom of exploring the Pacific and then visiting these exotic ports because he had been to China, he'd sailed the China Sea, he'd been to Japan, he'd been to all these, these places in Asia, which fed his fascination with and appreciation of really Asian aesthetics. He talked about going down to Tahiti when the girls all still ran around half naked like that. But he loved the Pacific, uh, and I believe that he got to Hawaii in maybe the late 20s, something like that. I, I remember he loved to say when he first got off the boat, 
The old timers had said, oh, kid, they've wrecked the place. You should have been here in 05. So it's like always, you know, going on with the changes. He loved Hawaii. He never budged once he found Hawaii. He loved the physical presence of Hawaii. The real culture, the impact of Hawaii is, you know, what they call the Aina. Hawaii is further from any other landmass in the world. It's the one place where you really are out in the middle of the lake. He treasured that and he treasured being surrounded by that water and the cultures that came through there. You can speak pigeon, you know, to where he is almost, you know, untranscribable. Hey, bro, where do $5 poke stay? What? Where does the $5 poke stay? Where are your $5 tattoos, right? They always called it poke, like poke one, bro. After a while, you learn to speak it, you know? The tranquility and calm of this last outpost would soon be shattered by world events. Events that shaped both Hawaii and Sailor Jerry's future. Before World War II, Hawaii was a, a relatively underpopulated place. I mean, I think there were less than half a million people on all the Hawaiian islands. It had only become part of the United States in the late 1890s. It was basically an imperial possession of the United States. But it wasn't a state, of course. They didn't get to vote. Again, very few Americans had ever been there. But when the Japanese bombed the place December 7, 1941, suddenly it was the heartland. Americans are remembering with vengeance in their hearts. Avenge December the 7th. On to victory. The Japanese hit it. They hit it hard because it was where America's naval projection in the Pacific was. And so Americans understood when they hit Hawaii, they were aiming at America's heart. And Americans suddenly said, yeah, Hawaii is us. Now, there had already been sailors there. There had already been soldiers there. So that was a familiar part of the landscape. But we're talking about a few thousand soldiers and sailors. By the middle of World War II, a million soldiers, sailors, and Marines were making their way through Oahu and Maui and the Big Island. Now, these were guys who had been indoctrinated to hate the Jap. I mean, for real, they were going to go over there and have to kill Japanese people. The Japanese are not easy to know. I've lived among them. The real difference is in their minds. Ever the one for patriotic adventure, Jerry immediately went to re-enlist in his beloved Navy. But the young salt sticker had already seen better days. Instead, Jerry found himself in the Merchant Marines, navigating supply ships through Japanese waters which led to three ships being shot out from beneath him. This, of course, led to some extended shore leave with Jerry honing his machine skills. He had terrific stories of tattooing up by the uh, Air Force and Army base up in Wahiawa. They'd go up there on the Army paydays, and he said they tattooed on a front porch, and they would hang the flash off the porch rail and tattoo out on the lanai there and tattoo off batteries, you know? And they'd just tattoo them all and stay up there for a couple of days, and when the guys were broke, they'd come back down to Honolulu. Jerry tattooed in some of the arcades and then eventually opened his own shop Tom and Jerry's, and I think the guy Tom, a Chinese guy, also is his partner in the photo booth deal, where they take pictures of sailors against a painted backdrop of like a gra little grass shack, and his Chinese partner's wife would pose as the hula girl with the sailors. But Chinatown, Hotel Street, was the main action center. The fleet is anchored off Honolulu, the promised land of Liberty Party. Soon, the glad cry of all ashore that's going ashore echoes throughout the ship, and eager sailors embark in ship's boat. You can imagine what it was like for a million soldiers and sailors to show up on this, this rock, as they called it. I mean, there were very few tourists there. But now you got a million guys with time to kill. And these are guys sometimes on their way to war, sometimes on their way back to war. They were not, like, looking for elegant, pretty, cute entertainment. And there was a whole district set up just for these soldiers and sailors. It was called the Hotel Street District. I worked on Hotel Street, yeah. I worked for a Filipino man named Muzzy Enos, who told me some fantastic stories about World War II and tattooing on Hotel Street. No, I ain't gonna tell you. <laughs> Men went there really for three simple reasons. They went there to get drunk, they went there to get sex, and they went there to get tattooed. Stewed, screwed, and tattooed. I mean, it was for real, that's what they did. Virtually all the tattooing in the old days was in downtown Honolulu, in what they called Hotel Street areas. Chinatown, it's where all the sailors poured in off the ships. In the pre uh, 
jet airplane days where everybody come in, came in on a big luxury liner, they would spew out at Aloha Tower, and the kids would be diving for coins there, and the lay makers were there. That's right at the base of where everybody filters up into Chinatown. Everything was available. Everything happened there. There was prostitution. Burlesque joints, whorehouses, bars. There were drugs, there was alcohol, there was gambling. Of course, there were tattoos. Hotel Street was a great place. They had the Hubba Hubba Club, which was a strip joint. All the way down the other end, there was a bunch of, uh, uh, what do we used to call them? They were guys, but they, they were dressed up like homosexuals. You know, they weren't really looking for girlfriends, they were looking for guy friends. It was a place where anything went, and it was catered to these soldiers and sailors. For too long, we have allowed a social taboo to prevent effective discussion and action. Boy. Everybody knew it. It was above board. There were lines down the street for brothels. Bars were kicking people in and out, drinking four shots of whiskey as fast as they could get them to spend their money. You've got to imagine hundreds of guys swarming into a bar to get four drinks. That's the most you could get. It was a four, four drink max. And they gave them to you all four at once. You got four shot glasses, and you were supposed to go bang, 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 drink them and leave. There was no hanging out because there were 50 guys behind you who wanted their four shots. The other thing that I love about this is, you think of a bar, you think it's one o'clock in the morning. It's all in the daytime. These bars are closed at night. There's a curfew. I mean, it's wartime. There's, there's no lights on in Hawaii at night. So everything, the brothels, the drinking, the tattoos, it's the middle of the day. So you got drunken, whoremongering, tattooed men wandering up and down the streets in the middle of the day. And you can imagine how many fights there were. I mean, it's just unbelievable seeing the whole time. Did I ever have problems with Navy guys? Jesus Christ, where the fuck are you been? Maybe you should take a warm shower before you hit the sack, Bunce. Maybe you don't eat right. Could be the detail you're on's too tough. <laughs>